Hello. 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 My name is Houston. And this is Media Media Mood Board. Today we're going to be looking at my September watch list. Books, movies, and games I'm interested in exploring in September. Let's get into it. First, we're going to talk about the new releases that I'm interested in that are coming out September 2023. Come with me to a seance. Spot the con I can't. Detective, you are here to discredit me, but I can talk to the dead. A Haunting in Venice is the next installment in Kenneth Branagh's take on Agatha Christie's mustachioed Belgian detective. This time, the locked room murder takes place at a seance. <laughs> Listen, I know these are extremely cheesy, but uh, I like them a lot. I got a soft spot for them. Get a bunch of celebrities in, in a locked room and do a murder mystery. Come on. This one seems to be really leaning into genre, so I'm interested to see if that elevates it or if that gets in the way of the story. We'll see. Yo no quiero vivir 250 años más. ¿Por qué no? Porque me trataron de ladrón. A un soldado se le puede decir que es un asesino, pero no que es un ladrón. Pero robaste, ¿o no? El Conde is a Chilean dark comedy about a world-weary dictator turned vampire who is planning his own death after being exhausted from complicated family drama. This looks really beautifully shot and that it has a distinct point of view, which is a tough break for 2023's other vampire comedy, Renfield, which was neither of those. Also, the main character who was once a dictator in this is based on a real Chilean dictator from the 70s, so I'm interested to see how they walk that line. I'm suffering from a temporary blockage at the moment. No, turn it back on. One. G flat. She Came to Me is about an opera composer with writer's block who finds inspiration after a one-night stand with a strange woman who begins to stalk him after the opera based on her becomes a hit. I watched The Red Shoes for the first time a couple months ago in prep for Barbie, so these on-stage sequences are really interesting to me. Visually, I really like how this looks. It's got fun performers. It's a fun premise. I'm not sure if it's a romance or a thriller, maybe both. Regardless, I'm really anticipating this. The letterbox reviews seem middling on it, but honestly, that doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, Okay, so despite this movie coming out at the end of the month, there's still no trailer for it, which is strange. Uh, But I guess we're getting two Wes Anderson movies in one year this year. The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar is a short film adaptation of the children's story by Roald Dahl and is the first in a four-part installment of Dahl adaptations from Wes Anderson. This one tells the story of a rich man hearing about a guru who can see without his eyes and then he tries to become his pupil so that he can use that skill to cheat at gambling. I think Wes Anderson has a great sense of humor, and I also thought Asteroid City was a real big standout, so uh, of course I'm interested. And it's on Netflix, which I, I'm already paying for. So, While I didn't like the totality of the French Dispatch, I thought that some of the shorter elements of it were really, really well done. So I'm excited to see Wes Anderson play in this shorter form language. Now we're going to talk about old releases. These are either things that are recently restored and coming to theaters or just showing into the theater near me or things that I'm hoping to stream. Typhoon Club is a coming-of-age slice-of-life story about a group of school kids who get stuck sheltering in their school during a typhoon. Originally released in the 80s, a 4K restoration came out this year. The Japan Society premiered it in New York City a couple months ago, and they built a block of programming around it. I didn't get a chance to go see this one in theaters, but I did see another one of the movies in the programming block, P.P. Rider. I know. And I was really blown away by it. We were just talking about Wes Anderson, and if P.P. Ryder is anything to go by, then Shinji Somi's work, it has a similar appeal as far as from like the dollhouse vibe. If this has anywhere near the same intricate diorama with a long take through it that P.P. Ryder had, I'm going to be super happy. Manda. The 
The film form has a retrospective this month for the West African director Usman Samben, and Mandabi is a part of that. This is a comedy for people who consider Kafka comedic. Um, a man receives a large monetary gift, and the movie follows all the obstacles and the bureaucracy that get in his way of doing this seemingly simple task of just cashing this money order. It's like if you give a mouse a cookie vibes. I've never seen anything from this director before, and it looks just beautiful and also funny. What do you think changed it? The professor changed it. You at Belfort was the first one that started traveling to different festivals in the United States. I'm a big fan of Les Blank, and last month I saw Innocence Abroad, which is a more fringe movie in his filmography. This one is much more squarely in line with his typical output. Recently remastered in 5K, I Went to the Dance tells the story of the music and culture of French Southwest Louisiana. Yowza! <laughs> Volver is a melodramatic comedy about a family of women in Madrid whose mother comes back from the dead to fix her unfinished business. I don't have much more to say about this. I'm trying not to look into it that much. I just watched Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown a few days ago and absolutely loved it. Uh, so I'm following that up with this by the same director. As less and less of our funds come from the state government, uh, how do we, first of all, maintain our preeminence, but secondly, how do, how do we guarantee our public character? After watching and really loving the documentary Our Body last month, a documentary that the director herself said was really inspired by Weissman, I figured now is the time for me to try out a Frederick Weissman movie. This one's called At Berkeley, and is a four-hour documentary about the ins and outs of Berkeley University. Weissman has been described as a very novelistic documentarian. Not sure what that means. We'll find out. And I have friends in higher education, so I'm aware of the types of drama that go on in these kind of places, but I'm curious to see how this is constructed. Now, Wiseman does actually have a new movie that's coming out this month. It's profiling like a Michelin star restaurant. <laughs> but this one just seems more fun, which I know sounds maybe weird for a four hour documentary. But, you know, it's about school, which feels very autumnal to me. I'm just more in the mood for it. Okay, so I'm still reading through The Other Name by Jan Fossa. I'm about halfway through and I'm just basically savoring it. I'm really liking what he's playing with. It's a book that's told in first person, but constantly shifts narrators. And I'm really loving the weird formal stuff that he's doing to emphasize this kind of theme of doppelgangers. There's also some really vivid, like religious imagery in it that I think is really fun. Like there's this one passage about a nativity scene, slow and steady. And I know I should just focus on finishing that book and then move on to the next one. But we were painting our hallway earlier this week and we put an audio book on just to kind of, you know, have something in the background. And man, I, now, now I'm listening to that too. The book is called Fourth Wing. It's a super popular book. It's the first entry in this kind of age fantasy epic about this girl who's about to enter school. She wants to become a scribe, but her mom forces her to train to be a dragon rider. So she's in school and then everybody who passes the intense dragon rider training, you have the opportunity for a dragon to choose you. And if they do, you obtain a super specific magical power that's a combination of your and the dragon's innate abilities. It is truly just a tournament arc from an anime, and I haven't really gotten into an anime and and I haven't seen a tournament arc in so long that it's just this like it scratched this super specific itch that's just so fun. So yeah, I'm I may I'm listening to that a lot uh, instead of reading Yanfasa. My comic this month is Fatherland by Nina Bunavats. It's a partial history lesson of the Balkans, partial autobio story of Nina's dad, who was a Serbian terrorist who they became estranged from. And then one day she got a telegram that said he was trying to build a bomb and accidentally went off and he died. The first thing you probably notice about this is Nina's super dense art style. I really love it. It's really heavy and expressive, but because it is so labor intensive, it, there's a level of coldness to it, which is interesting, especially for these darker stories that she tells. I love this kind of stuff with this history lesson as well as her personal life. I'm really interested to see what she does when she plays with that. I've read one of her other books, Bezamina, which came out in like 2019, and I read that when it came out. 
that was the one that came after this. She seems to like using comics to kind of figure out herself and her history. And it's interesting to see her be so vulnerable. And in a way that's not just, I'm telling this story to get it off my chest, but she's very interested in storytelling and how different modes of storytelling can express these things. For instance, this story is about her obviously very complicated relationship with her dad. And Besom is this like dark fable about a sexual predator where the story opens up with a retelling of the Greek tale of Artemis and Cyprates and really deconstructs and then exploits the male gaze throughout it. It's really interesting. It's very, very dark and it is it is a hard read as you'd imagine. After you experience this entire story, there's an essay at the end where she talks about her own experiences and what led her to writing this in the first place. And it's very, you know, She feels compelled to explore these things, to expel them from herself, or at least to make sense of them. Graphic novel stuff can be so, you know, singular. You're writing it, you're drawing it, things like that, especially in indies. I'm always super interested to see when an auto bio is interested in storytelling literacy outside of just a diary comic. I'm still playing Armored Core right now, and I really actually love it. I know there's a lot of people who are kind of like, don't like it and honestly i'll probably keep playing it till the end of the month i'm just trying to savor it so i'm going to take this time just to highlight a few visual novels that came out this month that maybe if i wasn't playing armored core i'd play Paranormosite is a visual novel published by square enix it takes place one night in 1980s tokyo where several strangers are afflicted with different curses there are several main characters several main storylines and as a player it's your job to jump between each story to try and get to the bottom of where all these curses are coming from Gameplay wise, you can zoom out to kind of a flow chart and choose different parts of each different branching story as the night goes on to try to get to the bottom of it. Now, I haven't played that many visual novels, but I did play the Silver Case earlier this year and I really, really loved it. So I'm super interested in uh, diving deeper into it. I don't love the anime aesthetics for Paranormal Sight, but you know, that's something I could get over. The writer of this early on did sound design for the first Metal Gear Solid as well as some Tokimeki Memorial stuff. He did write on some other visual novel stuff more recently, but the pedigree of those earlier things being around those groups, I'm interested in seeing where this is going. I feel like I've also never seen a murder mystery done super well in a video game, so I'm interested in seeing how this kind of folklore aspect to it would enhance that story potentially. If Paranormosite was using kind of a meta flow chart, we're telling a story type thing, then Videoverse is taking the opposite approach. It wants to immerse you within the world of the storytelling and not setting you outside of it. Videoverse is a game about a kid on a video game forum in 2003 and the relationships that they make or try to maintain or the drama of the forum, etc. I really enjoyed Hypnospace Outlaw's approach to taking these old internet aesthetics and making a game out of it. And so I'm interested to dive back into that type of thing. It looks super cute and it would be nostalgic to jump back into an old video game forum. Well, you made it. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked what you saw, please feel free to subscribe here or follow us on Letterboxd. Next week, I'll have two videos. One is going through everything I saw in August and ranking them. And the second will be a primer for the New York Film Fest, just in case you're interested in going, but don't know what to see. Or you're not going, but are interested in seeing what they're playing and what might be coming to wide release. Once again, thank you. I'm Houston. This is Media Mood Board. Bye.